Welcome to the Hortons Channel. Today we're coming from the Motoring and Literary Art Festival at Silverstone Circuit. Why don't we have a brief look around our stand before we look around the event. So on the back we have our normal fantastic selection of out of print books and some very, very rare ones at that. Uh, new editions that I've recently found are some wonderful signed pieces in here, uh, particularly this Renault F1 book, which is signed by uh, Jean-Pierre Jabouy. And then as we work our way down here, we have uh, the out of print Jaguar D-type book produced from Palo Am Press. This is an absolutely pristine condition. This is a really fantastic book. If you don't have it already, it's uh, Una Vita per l'automobile. And it's a most incredible selection of photographs mixed with uh, extracts from Enzo Ferrari's uh, biography um, put to, you know, uh, photographs with, with uh, comments from his book. That, that's a very, very good book. Uh, we also have the Ryan Snodgrass book on the Carrera 2.7, which uh, in Europe is now completely out of stock. Uh, so we have the last remaining copies of these. This is, I've spoken about this book before. Um, it's one of the truly fantastic single model books. Uh, we also, this is a very good book on uh, Triumph Dolomite, the HC Dolomite. Um, and I recently bought the remaining stock of these. This is the leather bound edition, which comes in a beautiful slip case with a Triumph Dolomite badge. And then down the end here, it's a new edition. I just found this recently, and this is a very, very rare Japanese publication on 250LM. It's the most incredible. It has a CD-ROM and it has a little book inside. It's the most wonderful production. You very, very rarely see these. It was a limited edition, um, and there are hardly any out there, but that, that's very, very special. And uh, also, I found this in the same collection, which is kind of ties in with Un Vita per l'automobile. This is the first edition of Le Mio Joire Terrible, which is Enzo Ferrari's uh, autobiography. It was first produced in 1962. Uh, so this is a first edition with the first edition cover. But inside, this is actually signed to Autumn Beer Review. Autumn Beer Review was the Swiss uh, magazine that has been produced since about 1954. So it's to them, Ferrari, and this was actually signed on the first day of issue of the book. So that's particularly special. If we just go around to the front now, we'll see the uh, selection of new books. So, since uh, the last episode, there's been a couple of new editions. Um, Patrick Das had produced this most wonderful book on Alfa Romeo Julia TZ, which is a four volume set. And he's just come out with this new edition, which is Alfa Romeo Prototipi 1948-62. That's a, a very, very good book and should sell well. And then uh, also this is new from Dalton Watson publishers on uh, Dietrich cars and that's uh, as you can see quite a tome and there's very little on Dietrich cars and if we walk down the other end here on the new book section um, from Voiturettes to Formula One which I believe I mentioned in the last video which is on Maserati uh, Grand Prix cars well this is limited to 500 pieces but it's almost out of print and the 500 sold incredibly quickly. So you need to buy this while you can still buy it at the uh, published price. And then 
Uh, finally, we have Great British Racing Drivers, which is a photographic book by Indira Flack, who's actually just down here, you can see GBRD, is doing a signing today with John Fitzpatrick. And we'll be catching up later with John to discuss his career and uh, his attendance at a lot of these um, classic car events. So here we are outside the stand and we are here to uh, promote Great British Racing Drivers, the book by Indira Flack, who's just off camera here. John Fitzpatrick had organized to do a signing uh, because Indira took the most wonderful picture of John, as you can see here, <laughs> and this is signed. And uh, I thought it would be a good time to catch up with John. I've known John since I was about three years old. Uh, my dad, as you know from the other episode, was involved in sports car racing. And here we have one of the doyens of sport car racing. So, Well, I, I don't know about doyen, but uh, I did do a lot of sports car racing. And I knew your dad very well. Yeah. And I, I, I bought a lot of books off your dad. No, you did. You did. And they're, they're still in my library. <laughs> so how... You know, this is a, a historic event celebrating uh, motorsport past and also books and what have you. Did you ever think all those years ago when you were at the forefront of uh, endurance racing that you'd be here doing this sort of thing? No, it never crossed my mind, to be honest. And uh, it, I never thought about writing a book. And then when I'd stopped racing after a few years, someone, I was talking to somebody about it and they said, uh, my career, and they said, why don't you write a book? And I said, mm, I'll have a go at that. <laughs> and uh, it took me a couple of years. Well, it was extremely successful. We sold thousands of them. So. Oh, well, that's, yeah, I, I was very pleased with it. And uh, they made a good job of it. Lots of nice photographs. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a pleasure reliving everything, yeah. you know, remembering all the good times. What people may not know is that at a point in your life you could have either become a professional golfer or a <laughs> professional racing driver and so you are an incredibly uh, good golfer. Do you still play a lot of golf? I still play quite a lot of golf. Uh, you're right I did I left school to be to play golf and become a golf pro and uh, I had a couple of accidents, stupid falls, uh, and in fact one of the falls was out of an oak tree. I'd shinned up this oak tree to shake the branch to get all the acorns down so they could put them all at the side of the golf course to grow trees. <laughs> and I'm shaking this thing and suddenly the branch came loose and woof, I came down and broke both my wrists. So that put paid to my golf really, I never really recovered. And then uh, I just got into motor racing. My, my father, uh, he bought, he had a fantastic father. He was the greatest man ever. And uh, he bought me a Mini. And I hadn't been out very long when I was uh, 17. And uh, I was, I was uh, do you want to hear this? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah, it goes on a bit. Carry on, carry on. <laughs> uh, I, was I, I went out to the 
Shen there was a, a pub at Shenston just out of Sutton Coalfield, uh, the Bull at Shenston. And there was a Shenston car club on a Wednesday night. I was there one night with some friends and all these cars, rally cars, were outside. And I thought, oh, what's all this about? Went in, got chatting to them, and uh, they uh, encouraged me to get involved in the sport, the Shenston car rally, and it just went on from there. So uh, I, I never really worked, to be honest. Well, a, a few years, well, a, a fair few years after that, you became the first British touring car champion. Am I correct to say that? I think you were the first. When was that Jack Sears? Jack Sears. Jack Sears first. might have been the first. I think I was the youngest ever. Right. I was the youngest ever. Uh, well, I've forgotten which year, that's 66. I was about 22, 23, yeah. something like that. Uh, and uh, driving for, I was driving for Ford then and for Broadspeed. Yeah. Ralph Broad at Broadspeed. Yeah. And it was in a Ford Anglia, would you believe? You can't imagine now racing a Ford Anglia. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you'd so, be lucky to find one. They've all rusted away exactly. somewhere. <laughs> and of all, the, so of all the periods you were involved in, what, what was your sort of uh, favorite period? And oh, that's really difficult to say because I, you know, I was so lucky I never really hurt myself. I drove some good cars for some good teams and was lucky enough to, you know, have some success. And uh, I mean, I just progressed from one car to the next. The next one was better. The next one was better. Yeah. And of course, the last car I raced was the uh, 956 Porsche, which was a sensational car. Yeah. I mean, the ground effects. And that really was a sensational, I mean, over 200 mile an hour at Le Mans. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was fabulous. And I think my, my fondest win ever in that, was in that car at Brands Hatch in the 1,000 kilometers together with Derek Warwick. And uh, we beat the Rothmans works cars. That was and, in the, it was a wet race, wasn't it? Yeah, we had a bit of help because we, uh, we had Goodyear tires, which were very good in the wet. Yeah. So that was a bit of an advantage, but to be fair, Derek was sensational. I mean, Derek, to, for me, if Derek had ever had the right car, he would have been world champion. Yeah. He was a great driver and a super guy. Ni nicest guy you could ever wish to meet, yeah. yeah. And then after your racing career, you were secretary of the BRDC for a number of years? Yeah, I was here at Silverstone for a number of years, which I enjoyed, still being involved, you know, in sport. And yeah. uh, my big event really was the historic festival, which I think I, I'm not bragging, but I think I helped to put the historic festival on a different level. Yeah. And of course it is, it is a big, a big event. So uh, that was, uh, Coy's first was here in 1990, 91, was it? Yeah, I think it was about that. Coy's, Jeffrey Pattinson. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I mean, those early events were just incredible events. I remember coming as a kid and it was, they were just, you know, the, the, not only the, the quality of the racing, but just the cars that were oh, here. The just, cars were sensational, yeah. weren't they? Just millions of pounds worth of cars. <laughs> incredible, really. Yeah. It always surprised me that these guys who owned these, you know, multi-million dollar cars would be out there racing them. Yeah. I mean, it was just fabulous, really. But that's what they were made yeah. for, I suppose. That's what, exactly, that's what they made for, but some pretty wealthy people involved, I think. <laughs> well, uh, we'd like to do another chat with you in, in more depth uh, in, the, in the future, if that's okay with you. Yeah, anytime, Ben, I always enjoy chatting to you. But it's been great to see you here. Uh, thanks for coming to do the book signing and yes. thanks for spending some time with us. Pleasure. Cheers. Good to see you, Ben. So here we are outside the stand again and I happen to catch Howden Ganley. And we have his book here, Road to Monaco, which has been out a number of years, but is actually out of print now. So you did an incredible job of selling 3,000, wasn't it? Two and a half thousand. Yeah, we were going, I was told just print a thousand, and then I thought, well, oh, let's double it, go for two thousand. And then I realized that the last 500 had come for next to nothing. Why the guy's got his foot on the loud pedal? So we did 2,500. I was assured we would never sell any of them. All well, gone. It, and it had great reviews, and yeah, you were up yeah. for the RAC yeah, Book of the Year yeah, award. Yeah, so it was a, all, 
real success. It's turned out extremely well. For a book that I just started writing for my wife, not to sell, and here we are. Well, and that's how I really knew you from when I was a child, because Judy used to do all the timekeeping at Charles Ivy during the Tiger days. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I remember going to uh, Hockenheim with you and all, all sorts of places. Yeah, she was fantastic. She could time so many cars all at once because she was terrific at arithmetic. And those days, all on, timed on one watch, not on all on the batch. And yeah, so she was at all the Group C races. Yeah. 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 Good days. And so Tiger was a, a real success for you. Yeah, it started by accident, and um, Tim came to me with this proposal to check for him, and I said, why don't we do it? And I said, all right, well, let's uh, start. And I'm not doing it for a day more than 10 years. And it, it just took off, um, became remarkably successful. And at the end of 10 years, I said, hey, time to go. Well, sold it and win. <laughs> so another successful venture. Yeah, I've been very lucky my businesses, they've all worked out. My gearbox business was terrific, um, Tiger was terrific, uh, the fuel system company, everything is, I guess I'm just lucky. I mean. And then prior to that, heading right back to very early days, you were the third employee of McLaren? I was. Another one of my lucky breaks is that uh, I was diddling around, I'd had a couple of free drives, but you know, free drives are free for a good reason because they're no good they're not worth anything and uh, so I needed to hang back and regroup and then one day phone rang Bruce McLaren it's going to expand my team do you want to come and work for me thank you very much start next Monday that's where we were incredible and then it went on from there uh, it gave me a lot of opportunities and then the second most important phone call I've had, also from Bruce McLaren, he said, uh, would you like to come to Goodwood for a Formula One test? And so pretty soon I'm in Formula One. And so here we are at Silverstone, and how many British Grand Prix did you drive at during your time in F1? Not nearly enough. Um, I did here in 71. Uh, I didn't do brands in 72 due to Louis Stanley's machinations. Uh, and then I was here with Williams in 73. And then I should have been here in 74 with Mackie, but once again, their car wasn't ready. So unfortunately, that was it. But I loved Silverstone. So in 71, that was with BRM? Yeah. And so was it a competitive car in the 71 season? It was. Um, I had a puncture when I was going well, fairly well up. Uh, I had to make a stop. And then trying to catch up, I made the second fastest lap of the race, just a tenth behind Jackie Stewart. It was a lap record. And that was during days in the 70s. It was absolutely packed here with spectators, wasn't it? Yeah, huge crowds there back then. Um, but I think the British Grand Prix has always attracted huge crowds. Um, and this is a great circuit. And uh, a thing that uh, John Watson was alluding to earlier on in his lecture today is that you had lots of cars then. You know, anyone could start a team, uh, unlike this silly thing now where you've only got 10 teams. Where you think there should be at least 12 teams, 24 cars, but back then you got 30 or 35 cars in a Grand Prix. Yeah. A lot better for the spectators. Well, in all different shapes and sizes and colors. And yes, exactly. Said V8 engines and V12 engines and flat 12 engines. and. Uh, as you say, all the different chassis. And in those days, you could go to, say, March, buy a chassis, and you had to go to Cosworth, and for 6,500 pounds, you could buy a brand new Formula One engine. You go to Hewlands for about 700 and odd quid, you buy a gearbox, then you needed a transit van and a trailer and one and a half mechanics, and you were a Grand Prix team. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. Um, also, driving into Silverstone last night, and seeing all the new additions to the business parks and what have you. But you were really at the forefront of that whole movement with your involvement with the BRDC. Yeah, when I was uh, asked to be uh, by John Fitzpatrick, who happened to be standing there, 
um, asked to stand for the board and then I was elected to that and then pretty soon I was asked to go on Silverstone Estates board so yeah, I had a lot to do with building up the industrial estate here but of course the club sold that off all off a few years ago and then I was on Silverstone Circuits board as well so I, I all three directorships it was really fun time and you've so you've been hugely involved in this uh, in the history of this circuit yeah um, Never dreamt anything like that would happen to me in my life, but there it was, you know, more lucky breaks. And it just went on and on and on and served with some of the really good people on the board. Great times. Well, I'd like to do another episode and delve into your career and uh, motor racing backgrounds more in depth. But sure. thanks for spending the time stopping by. It's wonderful to see you as oh. always. Thank you very much, Ben, and I remember you from, from when you were about that height when you used to come with your father to the races. <laughs> well, you were the team mascot. In, my, uh, in one of the episodes, I said what a, an effect that had on me as a, you know, as a child. It was yeah. incredible times. Yeah. You were really, really kind. So, yeah. Anyway, thank Good. you very okay. much. Okay, thank you. Cheers. So here we are in the Star Cars Hall where Gerardo and Co have a, an incredible selection of uh, cars on show and cars for sale. I'm here with Peter McAlpine and can you just talk us around the stand what you have on show? Yeah absolutely so um, starting off with what's actually for sale um, we have here we have the 2002 Ferrari 550 Maranello Pro Drive this is chassis 5 um, so one of the middle of the production cars um, and it was the 2003 Petit Le Mans winner. It also did a few Le Mans 24 hours as well. Um, fantastic car, freshly, uh, freshly restored after living in, uh, living in the States for a few years. So, um, yeah. I know these Thank cars you. well because a good friend of mine, Robert Purgle, mm. uh, ran a 550 Maranello at Le Mans in 2006 and 2008 uh, yeah. and we were guests of his and it was incredible to yeah. see them run in period. In fact, Peter Cox drove for him in 2008 and uh, bend right. it and uh, yeah, he wasn't best happy with that. Yeah, I mean, they are just fantastic things as yeah. I'm sure you know. We've, uh, the reason we're here at the Literary Fair is because of the book that we've done on the 550 Pro Drives, um, kind of telling the complete story. And uh, yeah, we're such a fan of them. The noise of them is just the, the thing that sticks with you. The so the screaming past you. coming back to the book, it's yeah. a limited edition of yeah. 550, 550 copies. 550 copies. Yeah. And how are you getting on with selling them? They're going okay. They're going yeah. okay. We've uh, we're still waiting for a few of the uh, of the reviews to come out, and yeah. they've been kind of universally really positive so yeah. so far. Um, so yeah, eventually, eventually, I mean. As you know, limited edition books, they do take a little bit of time these days, but you know, everything's, everything's kind of coming together. Yeah, and, on, and a hugely significant car. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, probably the, the origins of, of Ferrari's win uh, this year. You'd say it could be the starting point. Yeah. Um, interesting that it is, a, it is a Ferrari that Ferrari didn't really want to do. It's no. Kind of, you know, this inspired everything after that. It inspired the 575 and all of the other cars and the fact that the 575 came along and each individual chassis has won more than each all of the 575s put together is yeah. kind of testament really. And then at the back here you've got a so yes. 400 Super America. Behind us this is a 1962 400 Super America short wheelbase coupe aerodynamica uh, and one of the main things about this car is the covered headlamps. Yeah. So the 400 in terms of the tiers of how desirable a car is. It's the short wheelbase is the most desirable. Then we have uh, the covered headlamps is the most desirable because of the beauty of the car. Well, the, these cars in period were for the hugely wealthy of the exactly. day. Exactly, this was kind of the, to me, I view this as the car that started modern Ferrari's kind of, uh, brand, brand style, the way they did things. This is the first car, one of the very first cars that you had to actually be personally invited by Enzo to buy it. Yeah. Um, this car was finished from new in blue Sarah, which is slightly slightly different to this color, but with, and this is the best thing, I'm, I'm, we're trying to get someone to commit to it when they buy it, a turquoise Connolly leather interior. I'd which, be up for that. Yeah, can you imagine? Really <laughs> cool. And uh, yeah, maybe if we go and look at the back of the car, because yeah. that's one of, its, one of its best elements. But I mean, whenever you come around the back of this car and you 
you look at it, it's so, I don't know, it feels very jet age to me. Yeah. Well, it was, it was way, time. way ahead of its time. Exactly. It was incredible. And the design with the lights in the, in the rear bumper, it's, yeah. it's really, really amazing. And then over here, what yeah, do you have here? Something, something slightly more modern. Yeah. Um, so this is a 2013 Ferrari 458 GTE. It's one of the 11 works IF Corsa cars. Um, it's saying there's a very a, a, a bit of a gap in understanding for these cars, where the works cars are a lot more a lot more um, special than the customer cars. It's a real a real difference. Um, but this car has only ever been with AF Corsa. Um, it did two Le Mans 24 Hours. Uh, the second time it was on pole in GT. Yeah. Um, yeah, fantastic car. Fantastic. Thing. It, as a company, you've uh, especially at um, in Retromobile in mm. Paris, you really changed how um, classic car companies have gone about things and had a lot of, of modern cars, yeah. which no one's really done before. Exactly. So. We, we like to. The nice thing is we like to kind of be a bit more varied in what we do. Um, we have kind of one main criteria for every single car that we take on, which is if we like it. Yeah. It's not about. I mean, value obviously helps, um, but yeah. if we don't believe in it, if we don't like it, we're not going to do the best job on the car. So the reason we have this car is because we think it's a very special thing. Yeah. We think it's the history on it is fabulous. We found it from the right collection. All yeah. of these, all of these little pieces come into, into one big whole car and you think, wow, this is the one that yeah. we should buy. Yeah, no, it's it's in a great looking car. It's just such a great looking car, isn't it? And the the livery, having the seventy one, which yeah. is one of the Ferrari works numbers. Um, yeah, again, another car that is incredible because of its sound. It's yeah. the last generation of naturally aspirated Ferrari. And then finally, a uh, most incredible car, yeah. a Le Mans winner. Yeah. So this is uh, this one is not for sale. Uh, this has been lent to us by a very very good friend and a very good client um, and this is the 250 slash 275p that won Le Mans twice yeah outright and this this car was with or am I getting the mix I thought Terry Hoyle had was uh, looking after this for a while or am I mistaken might well have might well have been this car this car is now uh, looked after and prepared beautifully by uh, the light car company in fact yeah um, and I just want to show you something here because this is how numbers were painted in yeah. period with a paintbrush. And you, some, you know, cars today are so over restored, but mm. um, you know, my dad, who went to many Le Mans in this period, yeah. so they were never shiny like this. No. And, they, and they just whacked the numbers on at exactly. the last minute. So this car, this car came from the Mar du Clos yep. um, collection, which is the Bardenon collection. Um, and our friend and client bought it a few years ago and his first port of call was to send it back to Ferrari make sure it was perfect to as it finished its yeah. second Le Mans in 64 um, so it was it's not just anyone that's done these numbers Ferrari themselves and yeah. Classico did the hand brushed in numbers yeah no, and, that, and I love things like that yeah. that's how it should be and all of the little details you can tell it is just a pure racing car because if you look down at the uh, at the gate of the gear lever yeah. the way it's drilled out just for a little bit of extra light that's yeah. the very very kind of functional way that the steering wheel is basically just on the dashboard it's kind of very much uh, very much kind of function first and then yeah. you know the drivers will deal with it yeah no, you see gorgeous. People, you see people try and sit in it, and you're kind of like, the seat's in one place, the wheel's in another, and then the pedals are somewhere <laughs> outside the car. Yeah, great. yeah. you have to learn how to drive it, the, yeah, exactly. not to uh, change exactly. the seat to how it fits you. Yeah. Well, thank you for your time, and Gerardo and Co have been a real big supporter of this event, and uh, personally, I hope it goes on again. So, yeah, so do I. thanks for your time. Nice to see you. <laughs>
Well, I hope that's given you a flavor of the show. Please remember to like and subscribe to the channel, and we'll see you in the next episode.